Welcome to a live BYU Forum broadcast. Today, Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman, president of Yeshiva University, will address the campus community. The forum originates from the Marriott Center on the BYU campus. Good morning, and welcome to our first forum assembly of the winter semester. My name is Shane Reese, and I serve as the academic vice president. Today, it will be our honor and pleasure to hear from Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman, president of Yeshiva University. His presentation today is entitled Covenant versus Consumer Education. The beautiful prelude music this morning was provided by Brooke Ballard, a senior in piano performance from Riverton, Utah. Our organist was Levi Kelly, a graduate student in organ performance from Rexburg, Idaho. And our music conductor was Momile Lu, a senior in music from Beaverton, Oregon. Thank you all for that music that so perfectly set the tone for today's forum. I invite you to join us next Tuesday for our campus devotional, where we will have the opportunity to hear from Elder Mark A. Bragg, General Authority 70 of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today's invocation will be offered by Janae Wright, a junior majoring in philosophy from Austin, Texas. Sister Wright. Our Father in heaven, how thankful we are for this day and for the gift of education which we are blessed to receive here at BYU. We are thankful for the occasion to convene here and listen to the words of Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman, who has graciously set aside time to visit us at our school and prepare a message for us. We pray for all the good that he does. We pray for a divine presence to be with us in this meeting. We ask that that would touch our minds to be receptive to the message and our hearts to change accordingly. We are thankful for the work being performed at Yeshiva University and pray for that work to be supported. We are thankful also for the students visiting with us from Yeshiva University. We pray that their experience um, will be good and positive with and among us. Father, we, we pray that we might build upon relationships with other religious people in the world. We pray for the Judah for the Jewish community, especially in light of recent events happening is in Israel. Father, we're grateful for that community and for the opportunity to build friendships with them. We pray for greater understanding and religious literacy to build upon these sacred friendships. We pray that through these efforts and through this message that we can turn towards the in greater consciousness and devotion. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you, Sister Wright. It is now my privilege to provide a brief introduction of today's speaker. Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman is the fifth president of Yeshiva University. During his tenure, Rabbi Berman has grounded Yeshiva University in its core Torah values and laid the foundation for its next great era. Through his visionary leadership, the university has grown dramatically, introducing over 20 new graduate degrees in emerging fields, and has established new academic centers, such as the Emil A. and Jenny Fish Center for Holocaust Studies, and the Rabbi Jonathan Sachs Herrenstein Center for Values and Leadership. The university has seen significant increases in enrollment, academic rankings, as well as philanthropic gifts. Rabbi Berman is an active and erudite thought leader and spokesman for the Jewish community. He lectures widely throughout the world and has written numerous articles on subjects addressing contemporary Jewish thought, modern philosophy, faith-based value systems, and trends in higher education. He recently published the new book, The Final Exam, Letters to Our Students, in which he presents the core Torah values that inspire a life of wisdom, contribution, and purpose. Yeshiva University, over a century old, is the nation's flagship 
Jewish University providing values-driven education for generations of families throughout the world. It will now be our privilege to hear from Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice President. It's an honor to be here at Brigham Young University, a stellar university that stands by the side of its students in their faith journey, graduating outstanding leaders and citizens of our country. My deepest thanks to President Kevin Worthen for inviting me to speak at this forum. I remember when I received the invitation, I was so excited, January to come to BYU, and then I looked closely, and it was not BYU Hawaii. <laughs> but I have to say that the deep appreciation I have for the weather here is only offset by the tremendous warmth and hospitality of my reception by this amazing BYU community. It's also my pleasure to acknowledge the presence of my dear friend, Elder Clark Gilbert, who is with us today, a partner in working on faith-based education, uh, not just here, but in the country at wide. You know, every day on the way to my office on the 12th floor of our Belfer Hall, I'm reminded of Yeshiva University's storied history. Right before I enter the doors of my office, I see the pictures of the four previous university presidents who stewarded our institution, each of whom built upon the successes of their predecessors, navigating the challenges and opportunities of each generation. But as I walk past the office lobby, waiting outside the door to my office, I'm reminded of the larger history beyond our institution of religious education in America. Outside of my office is a frame letter the original of which is owned by our university museum, written in May of 1818 by Thomas Jefferson to Mordecai Manuel Noah, a prominent Jewish leader at the time. In this letter, Jefferson speaks of the Jewish condition in America, and I quote, Your sect, by its sufferings, has furnished a remarkable proof of the universal spirit of religious intolerance inherent in every sect, disclaimed by all while feeble, and practiced by all when in power. Jefferson opens by remarking on the sad universal state of religious intolerance to which the Jewish people bear witness by its sufferings throughout history. He continues by noting, that our laws have applied the only antidote to this vice, protecting our religious as they do our civil rights by putting all on an equal footing. But more remains to be done. For although we are free by the law, we are not so in practice. Public opinion erects itself into an inquisition and exercises its office with as much fanaticism as fanned the flames of an auto de fe. Here, Jefferson remarkably speaks to the fact that there are two forces in public life that have enormous power to coerce and subjugate religion. The first is the law that he believes has been set up successfully in the United States, formulated to protect religious minorities. The second is public opinion, which still poses a threat as there are many ungovernable ways in which public opinion can be unleashed against a religious minority. But Jefferson proposes a solution to this universal dilemma of religious intolerance, and I quote, nothing I think would be so likely to affect this as to your sex, particularly as the more careful attention to education, which you recommend and which placing its members on the equal and commanding benches of science will exhibit them as equal objects of respect and favor. The answer, Thomas Jefferson writes, is in education. For by educating Jews to be experts in the sciences and the scholastic and professional fields, 
we will then be thought of as equal objects of respect and favor. This letter was written in 1818, but as it addresses the fundamental challenge facing religious minorities in a democracy, it could have been written today. For still in this country, 200 years later, we are at times faced with an environment in which public opinion acts like an auto de fe, in which we have seen and experienced modern day leaders and influencers who fan the flames of religious intolerance. And although Jefferson's advice focusing on education has guided our institution and so many others, as we have consistently advanced education and placed our graduates on equal and commanding benches in areas like the sciences, still, as Jefferson himself notes, more remains to be done. For all of our scientific achievements, for all of our contributions to medicine, for all of our rich literary history, for all of the personal stories of the generations that have been woven into the tapestry of the American story, more remains to be done. Religious education is still seen with suspicion. Interaction with the largest academic community is often framed as progress versus tradition, acceleration versus stagnation, an innovative vision of the future versus one that is shackled to the ideas of the past. This framing of religious education being outdated and debilitating is not so easily dismissed in our current cultural milieu. And while it is unfair and fundamentally wrong, I do believe that it is part of our collective work to formulate and highlight the enduring value of education in a religious setting, to explain first to ourselves and our children and then to the world the value and need for religious education. For in the absence of a compelling frame, we will not only be more susceptible to suffer the remarkable proof of the universal spirit of religious intolerance, to quote Thomas Jefferson, but even more significantly, deprive our next generations and our nation of the opportunities that a proper framing of a religious education promises to all. I want to share with you today how I conceptualize the need and value of education in a religious institution. And it's not solely through our contributions to science or any area of the academy, but a larger approach to life itself that touches the soul of our nation. Friends, we live in a consumer society one in which the acquisition of goods, products, and status are often seen not as a means to an end, but an end to itself. The great theologian and public intellectual Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of blessed memory once lightly put it this way, the consumer society was laid down by the late Steve Jobs coming down the mountain with two tablets, the iPad 1 and the iPad 2. And the result is that we now have a culture of iPod, iPhone, iTunes, I, I, I. This focus on the I fosters a very individualistic, egocentric culture in which one is constantly reminded by product placements and commercialism of all that one does not have instead of being thankful for what one does have. And the result is obvious, as Rabbi Sachs writes, through constant creation of dissatisfaction, the consumer society is in fact a highly sophisticated mechanism for the production and distribution of unhappiness. But there is another model of life which is not based on the consumer, but the covenant. The covenant was first introduced by God to Noah and all the descendants of the world and then afterwards was said specifically to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their children, the Jewish people. In this worldview, one's goals, life decisions, and very sense of self are thought in a whole different context. By illustration, 
I will share a story that just happened to me that highlights one aspect of this covenantal perspective. About 10 weeks ago, my father passed away. My father was a very important figure in my life, a loving presence in my heart. These past number of years, he was not well. He lost some of his strength and vitality. He was a man with great force and great spirit. It was hard to see him over these past couple of years. But his passing was unexpected and profoundly painful and difficult. Judaism provides a set pattern of mourning to help the mourner through the different stages of grief, allowing the mourner to integrate this painful new reality into one's life. One of the customs of mourning is for the mourner to recite a prayer which publicly sanctifies God's name called Kaddish every day, three times a day during our daily prayers. One of the requirements of this prayer is that it can only be said in a service with a quorum, which requires 10 men being present for prayer. Now this is not difficult when I, for example, am in Yeshiva University where there are prayer quorums running throughout the day. But when I travel, it becomes more of a challenge. So here's my story. During our winter intercession break, Yeshiva University had a student leadership trip which went to Rome and a second one which visited Morocco. I joined the trips and every day prayed in a quorum with my students. But there was a day in between that I traveled from one country to the next and did not have students for a prayer quorum for both afternoon and evening services. So what did I do? Well, when I was in Rome, I visited a Jewish day school. I shared my dilemma with the head of school and that afternoon, 10 teenagers who I never met before left their classes to pray afternoon services with me. Afterwards, I boarded a plane and landed in Casablanca. There's only one synagogue in Casablanca, and they had already finished services hours before I arrived. Knowing this ahead of time, my office called the parent of one of our students who lives in Casablanca and asked him for his advice, what I should do. No problem, he said. Just come to the synagogue whenever you arrive. My flight was a little delayed. I took a taxi from the airport. I got there after 10 p.m. Meeting me at the synagogue was the parent with eight other men who I never met before who came to pray evening services with me to help me commemorate my father's memory. Not only that, but they also suspected that I might be hungry after my trip. So they prepared for me a four-course catered dinner. And we ate together way until after midnight. I never met them before, and it was like I was coming home. From afternoon prayers with Jewish teenagers in Rome, to evening services with Sephardic men in Casablanca, to a late morning service in London with a room filled with Hasidim, Jews with beards and side curls, who date their origins to 18th century Poland. I have prayed with them, and they have helped me commemorate the life of my father. All of these people have never met me. In our lifetimes, we have never been introduced. What is it that enables me to join their circles so easily? Why are they moved to help someone whom they have never met before? So here's the secret. The secret of the Jewish people. We are all the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We all share the same mothers of Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel. Although we have never personally met, we are all one family. Now, if our personal identity just started when we were first born, 
This would not make any sense. But our sense of identity is covenantal. It's not simply defined by the moment, but by our past. From a consumer perspective, the past is history. You can learn from it. It might be interesting, but it's history. It's events that occurred at a different time and place. From the covenantal perspective, the past is not history. It's memory. Stories about the Exodus, Maimonides, the Holocaust, the founding of the State of Israel, these are not historical matters to us. They are passed down from generation to generation. They are all part of our memory and our identity. What greater expression of this point is there than the warmth shown to me to help me commemorate the memory of my father? Our whole lives, our memory, my loss, is their loss. My story is their story. We are linked in the grieving for the dead because we are bound by a covenant for life. So far, we've spoken about one key difference between the consumer and the covenant. The consumer focuses on the I and what's missing from life, creating a mechanism for fundamental unhappiness, while the covenant is focused on the we, guiding one to contemplate their lives in a broader sense of memory and purpose in the service of others. Let's discuss a second difference and then apply it to the world of education. When I served as a congregational rabbi, I would often advise people who were dating. I was always struck by those who came in with a long checklist about what they were looking for in a spouse. Some examples I'd find on these checklists include a detailed style of dress, a specified number of hours a day in religious study, a very specific type of personality, and a list of acceptable institutional affiliations and professional occupations. Now, of course, compatibility is important, but, and perhaps this is relevant to this crowd, A checklist is not how it will be found. Relationships, unlike purchases, are something that evolve and deepen. They are created together. A purchase is unilateral. If a car doesn't meet your specifications, it will not serve your purposes. But marriage is covenantal. It's not about objects, but relationships, and requires leaps of faith. C.S. Lewis, in his book on grief, which describes his grief after his wife passed away, noted that what he misses most about his wife is the way she surprised him. It was not what he knew about her already that excited him. It's what he did not know. It was the alterity, the mystery. It's the different and unexpected ways in which his wife grew and evolved, which pushed him to grow and evolve as well. This is different than a consumer. The consumer model is about acquiring possessions. It values detailed knowledge, metrics, research, analytics, and prioritizes the known and certain. But the model of the covenant is different. It prizes faith, empathy, loyalty, curiosity, and discovery. To be clear, there is a comfort in being a consumer. One knows the product, reads the warranty, and has the instruction manual. There's very little risk, in the, and very little risk. In the covenantal, however, there is exposure, vulnerability, uncertainty, and great risk. But the upside is different as well. The consumer is only transactional. The covenantal is transformational. One of the primary challenges in living in a consumer culture is confusing the two modalities. One should not go to the supermarket and approach their purchase of breakfast cereal like they were forming a covenantal bond with it. <laughs> and one must similarly not seek a spouse with the perspective of a consumer. When these lines are crossed, it creates problems. On the one hand, people fall in love with their cars their vacations, 
their corner offices. And on the other hand, people do not truly fall in love with their spouses, their purpose, or those around them. Living in a consumer culture as we do can affect our thinking, deeply impacting fundamental aspects of our lives, including the way we date, build relationships, and plan for our future. It also impacts the way we think of education. This is core to our mission at Yeshiva University, and I'll flesh it out by focusing on three questions. Who are our students? How do we study? And why do we study? So let's start with who are our students. Who are our students? The covenantal perspective is predicated on the notion that everyone has a place within the covenant. And our educational mission is to help our students discover their own story and experience within our larger one. The guiding light of our community and most esteemed rabbi to ever teach at Yeshiva University was Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik of Blessed Memory. He was the scion of one of the most revered rabbinic families in all of Jewish history. A master of Talmud and secular knowledge, his students and legacy animate our institution. He once said as follows, I may have very few good traits, he noted humbly, but one trait which I do possess is my inability to imitate anyone else. I always want to be myself and to display my unique dignity of having been created in the image of God. The glory of the individual is exemplified by the singularity of every human being. This concept, he said, is the motto of my life. I do not like to do what others can do better or just as well. I wish to do that which I am unique at. This is not an expression of haughtiness, no. It's a fulfillment of my intrinsic human dignity and individuality. This is the essence of a covenantal education, a recognition that each individual is created in God's divine image and as such unique. Our role is helping our students find, nourish, and develop their unique qualities so that they can become the best versions of themselves. And when I speak to my students, I try to speak in a way that would resonate. So in this point, I often quote from a movie, Chariots of Fire. By a round of applause, how many people here have seen Chariots of Fire? Just curious, similarly, by a round of applause, how many people have seen Napoleon Dynamite? I have no stories from Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> but I did hear that BYU put on Chariots of Fire just a few years ago. Now, while I did not attend that play, there is a scene that I'm sure was captured beautifully in the BYU production. So let me set the scene. Eric Liddell was a Scottish runner who won several gold medals in the 1924 Paris Olympics. Liddell came from a family of missionaries, and there's one scene in the movie where his sister confronts him and asks him why, as a believer, does he spend so much of his life in running competitions rather than joining alongside his family to spread the word of God. Eric responds to his sister by explaining, I believe God made me for a purpose. He also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. We all have a different way of feeling God's pleasure. We were each created for a purpose, and we each experience God's presence in our own unique ways. Our educational goal is to help students discover and develop the capacity to experience God's pleasure by finding the godliness within themselves, to identify and develop what makes you distinct, to help you on your journey of becoming the person you were always meant to become. It's very different from education in a consumer society. 
In a consumer society, people are objects. This comes in one of two varieties. As the saying goes, if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. Either you are simply a source for someone else's income as the buyer, or worse, you're the product being sold, whether it's your personal information, your attention span for ads, and a whole host of ways our current market has to capitalize on your time and turn us into dollar signs. In a covenantal society, however, education is not just a window into the world. It's a light into one's soul. What you study helps develop your whole personality. Whether you too are a runner or an artist, an educator or a healer, a value-driven education creates opportunities for one to develop the different aspects of the self, to discover purpose and experience divine pleasure in self-expression. Who are our students? Each student is different. Each student is born in God's divine image and in his holy work to be by their side in support of their personal journey? That's the first question. The second, how do we study? The answer to this question dates back to the time of the Bible. When the Jewish people accepted the Torah at Sinai, they collectively uttered the famous Hebrew words, na'aseh v'nishma, we will do, and then we will listen. It's a strange phrasing. Usually one first needs to hear the instructions, and only afterwards can you agree to execute the actions. We will do, and then we will understand. How can you do without understanding? The rabbis explain the covenantal relationships are different from the very beginning. In a consumer society, knowledge precedes commitment. One needs to know what one is buying before deciding on the exchange. The more you know, the better position you're in. But in a covenantal relationship, it's the opposite. Commitment precedes knowledge. One cannot access the knowledge unless one is first fully committed. It's like marriage, as we said before. Only once is there a commitment that vulnerability can be exposed. The one first is willing to put in the work even through the hard times to reach levels of closeness otherwise impossible to reach. That is what the Jewish people said about the Torah. God says to Moses and to the people, I have a book. The Jewish people answer, I'm in. Do you want to know what it says? No, I'm in. You got me at hello. Now that I'm in, I'll go study it. And what this orientation does is that it switches the premises. My commitment is not dependent on the difficulty of the text or the way it makes me feel at the moment. I am here to study it and keep it. And because of this attitude, we are driven to explore, study, and grapple with the Torah, Jewish ideas, and knowledge as a whole. Because we believe that all disciplines of knowledge teach us something about ourselves and God. So we are committed to understanding them. I see this at Yeshiva University every day. There are not enough hours in the day for our students. They are so hardworking and committed. Last year, for example, we had a phenomenon where our D3 men's basketball team won 50 games in a row. You could applaud that, that's worthy of this. <laughs> the country and people throughout the world were transfixed on the fact that the stereotypes were broken and the Jews were winning in basketball. <laughs> okay, we were at the time number one in the country, it's division three, but number one <laughs> in the country. New York Times, ESPN, Wall Street Journal all covered us. And our team is amazing. 
They play with their head coverings, with their kippot. We sing before every game, not just the Star Spangled Banner, but the Israeli national anthem, because we are both proud patriots and Zionists. And our players are the first not just to score a bucket, but to extend one, one's hand when an opponent had fallen to the floor. And they knew that when they walked out onto the court, that when they play for Yeshiva University, they don't just play for a school, they play for a people. But lost in all the coverage was the fact that they even had the time to practice basketball. You see, our typical college schedule is grueling. We have two curriculums, a Jewish curriculum and a secular academic one. Every student at Yeshiva University spends hours a day studying Torah, the Talmud, many not for any credit, before they even begin their academic classes. A large percentage return to the study hall for extra Torah learning at night. This is not to mention that we have prayer services three times a day. To be a student at Yeshiva University, you have to be totally committed. Na'aseh v'nishma. Commitment precedes knowledge. And what was amazing about the story that was generally left unsaid in the press was that our basketball team did not get off from any classes. They had to go through the same rigorous Torah and academic schedule like everyone else and find the time before or afterwards to practice. Because our core commitment is to education. And this is the story of the Jewish people. A lifelong, passionate appreciation and devotion to pursue Torah specifically and knowledge in general. And at the root of this is the mandate to seek truth. The truth of the Torah, and as Maimonides taught us, to seek the truth wherever it is found. We were committed from Sinai, and we remain committed until this day and forever. And this differs from a consumer society in which study of knowledge is utilitarian. How does it help your career? How can one use it to get ahead in life? Of course we have that too. And we have highly ranked schools and great career numbers. That too is an important part of life. But that does not drive our quest. For us, passion and study does not end upon graduation, but continues throughout one's life. For the consumer, education is about utility. For the covenant, it's mystery. It's predicated upon commitment, and it runs throughout our lives. And just like with relationships, if we approach our educational journeys with the incorrect spirit as a consumer, there are consequences. So long as higher education is exclusively focused on information and research for utility, we will be outpaced by technological change. Information drives consumer decisions, and there are better ways to access information than the halls of university. Just ask chat GPT. <laughs> but the covenantal model of faith will always provide meaning and values for the lives of our student. Faith nourishes, strengthens, and enriches life. It guides one beyond acquisition of information towards an earnest quest for truth. How do we study? With a lifelong passion to seek the truth. And this brings us to the final question of why we study. We are deeply rooted and forward focused. Often when I speak about the beginning of yeshiva, I hear a very common question, rabbi people ask. We know that yeshiva was established in 1886 and it's well over 100 years old. But why do you speak about yeshiva as if it was 3,000 years old? Because, I explain, we date our beginning from Moses at Sinai. That is the beginning of Yeshiva University. And in every generation, we have faithfully transmitted our tradition from generation to generation until today. Yeshiva University is a continuation of that story. 
But if we date our beginning at Sinai, what is our end? The end is redemption. Most universities, as part of the consumer society, have a five-year strategic plan. And as with any good business, we have that as well. But in addition to the five-year plan, we also consider a greater future. Imagine being in a company that has a thousand-year strategic plan. It changes the nature of the conversation when you speak in these terms. And when you enter into this conversation, you have moved past the consumer and into the covenant. And this is what we teach our students. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. famously said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We do not end until there is justice for all. And we teach our students to bend the arc, to use their God-given talents and skills and live a life of contribution and service, to locate their studies and personal development within a greater story. And in this story, they are all leaders. Our students are the leaders of tomorrow because they contextualize their lives within our covenant of faith. Faith is a reminder that your life is part of a larger story. Faith is a reminder that your life has a story. That you are not just accidents of history, but drivers of history. Why do we study? To lead lives of contribution and service for the Jewish people and for the world at large. These are our three questions. Who are our students? each student born in God's divine image, and it's holy work for us to be by their side in support of their personal journey. How do we study with a lifelong passion to seek the truth? Why do we study? To lead lives of contribution and service. These are the hallmarks of an educational institution with a covenantal framework, one that prizes faith empathy, commitment, loyalty, curiosity, resilience, and discovery, while highlighting the importance of being thankful with what one has and looking for opportunities to help others, where there is less focus on the I and more on the we. And I think this is the opportunity for us today. You know, I usually speak at Yeshiva University, which is in short, called Why You. Today, I stand at B, Why You. This very conversation represents opportunity. New bonds being forged, new friendships developed. And this is a model that can be expanded. There's so much talk of polarization in this country between right and left, Republicans and Democrats. But perhaps we can use our language to help heal divides, to reframe the narrative and address the real crisis in America, which is a crisis of meaning. As the 20th century thinker and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl wrote in Man's Search for Meaning, we all are seeking purpose and meaning in life. The consumer society provides answers that are ephemeral and not fulfilling. Perhaps what we need is to establish a covenant across America, one that is built on the recognition of the sanctity of each individual, a quest for truth, and an ambition to inspire the next generation to lead lives of service and contribution. Come with me now. Let us return to my office. Outside my office stands the words of President Thomas Jefferson. For Jefferson, education in a religious setting is to stem the problem of religious intolerance. Perhaps if minorities contribute more visibly, they will be seen, we will be seen, on equal footing with the rest of society. While that is a worthy goal, and one in which we continue to deeply hope for and pray for. For us, education has a different purpose entirely. 
This purpose was described by Moses in the Hebrew Bible in one of his last talks to the Jewish people standing in the desert plains outside of Israel. And he said to them, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statues and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? In contrast to Jefferson, Moses teaches us that education does more than placing its members on the equal and commanding benches of science so we can be seen as equal objects of respect and favor. Our Torah is meant to be a beacon of redemptive light, to show society the wisdom, decency, and dignity of living committed, spiritual, and meaningful lives. Our values-driven education shows society that there's more to life than being a consumer. We can approach the world and our lives as a covenant, where commitment precedes knowledge, where instead of transaction, we are transformed. Our education in both our religious and academic studies is a fulfillment of our covenantal worldview. Our five core Torah values, which emerge from this worldview, are displayed all throughout our campus. You could go to our campus on the elevators, on the walls, on the sides of buildings. You will see our five core Torah values which emerge from this covenantal perspective. Seek truth. Discover your potential. Live your values. Act with compassion. And bring redemption. Jefferson's mission is over 200 years old. Our educational mission is over 3,000 years old. Our education is not just so people will better appreciate the Jewish people. It's not just to get our students better jobs. It's not for the rankings of U.S. News and World Report. Everything we do is in service of a higher calling. In Hebrew, we have a phrase, hakol lichvodo, that is underneath our logo. You see in Yeshiva University's logo. Everything is created with the potential to bring honor to our Creator. And that is our educational mission at Yeshiva University. Hakol lichvodo, to educate our students to, to develop what is holy within them, bringing honor to God. Let me close then with one last story. Last week, I stood in a cemetery on the outskirts of Jerusalem for the unveiling of my father's tombstone. In the Jewish tradition, during the year of mourning, the family places a stone on the grave describing the deceased and marking his eternal resting place. But while I participated in this very emotional ceremony, I knew that this did not truly capture my reality. Because my father does not rest in the ground. He rests in my heart and I carry him with me wherever I go, as he carried his father, as his father carried his, dating back to Moses and back to Abraham. In the name of my father and all of the fathers who have stood before me, in the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and our mothers, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel, we will faithfully continue to transmit the terms of the covenant to our children and grandchildren, spreading God's word and infusing the world with God's spirit. A consumer questions value. 
A covenant discovers value. And a life of covenant brings a life of mystery, meaning, and purpose. And we should all be seen as equal objects of favor and respect before God and build lives of intrinsic human dignity and individuality. Hakol lichvodo, all in service of our higher calling, bringing honor to God. Thank you. We are so grateful to have Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman and his beautiful message, which he has shared with us today. Thank you for being here at our forum assembly. We will now excuse Rabbi Berman and his guests to meet their next obligation. The benediction will now be offered by Landon Wilson, a senior majoring in art history from Kaysville, Utah. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee for the visit of our dear friends from Yeshiva University, and we thank thee for the words of Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman. We pray for love in the hearts of those around us and in our hearts to grow together as friends and colleagues. We thank thee for the reminder of commitment and covenant to thee and to each other. We ask that thou wilt bless us with safe travels from this arena, and we thank thee again so very much for the words heard today. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This has been a live broadcast of a BYU campus forum. The address today was given by Rabbi Dr. Ari Berman. Find links to the full text, audio, and video of this address within the week at speeches.byu.edu. Don't miss next week's live devotional address at this same time with Elder Mark A. Bragg, a General Authority 70 of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and download the free BYU radio app for episodes of the Finding Center podcast, a daily half hour of inspiration and spiritual focus. BYU Forums are a production of BYU Broadcasting.